<laughs> How do you pronounce your surname? Uh, Duxbury. Okay, Duxbury, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> so the title of your talk is Chicken Gut Bi Microbiome Members Limit the Spread of Antimicrobial Resistance Plasmid in E. coli. Please. Thank you. Can you see? Okay, great. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak at this meeting. So very interesting range of topics covered. Um, so I'm currently a postdoc researcher at the University of Warwick and the group of Orkin Sawyer, um, working on uh, microbial diversity and interactions in photosynthetic microbial communities. Um, however, today I'm going to talk on my previous postdoc position. Uh, that I completed in the Laboratory of Genetics at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And this was in, um, in the group of I and Visa in collaboration with the Institute of Ecology, NEO, and a veterinary, veterinary epidemiologist based at Utrecht University. And this paper was published last year, so what I'm presenting on. So to give you some background, so as we've heard throughout this meeting, um, plasmid mediated, so antimicrobial resistance genes are commonly transmitted on plasmids, and this can occur both vertically and horizontally within bacterial populations, but then also at the level of the microbiome. So microbiomes, so for example, human and animal microbiomes, uh, dense concentrations where bacteria can transfer and this can occur between commensal strains, but also between commensal and pathogenic strains leading to uh, multi-resistant pathogenic bacteria. Um, so uh, conjugation is a major contribution to the spread and persistence of these resistance genes. And there are two main determinants um, controlling the spread of these genes um, within a community. Um, and these are firstly the fitness effects of the plasmid. So if they impose a metabolic burden on the host cell, interactions between other, with other mobile genetic elements in the cell. And secondly, the conjugation rate, so the speed of the plasmid transfer. And in particular, um, it, we can develop methods to quantify this as a rate rather than a frequency measure to take into account um, given cell-to-cell -cell contact opportunities, how fast will this plasma transfer under different conditions? So the, uh, the context of uh, my work is in understanding uh, the dynamics of plasma spread within the context of the microbiome. So um, from genomic studies, we can learn that uh, um, looking longitudinally, that uh, during the evolution of uh, bacterial lineages, uh, they can gain multi-resistance, which is associated with the transfer of a plasmid from another coexisting lineage within the same population. Um, and plasmids can spread to not only just within strains, but within a whole community. And in some studies in the literature, this has been described as plasmid permissiveness, so the diversity of different bacteri bacterial strains and taxes, which a plasmid can spread. Um, so that's one idea of understanding plasmid spread within a community. Um, but then we lack understanding of another aspect, so how biotic factors within a microbiome, so the role of microbial interactions, we know this plays an important role in microbial community dynamics. So, for example, competitive or co cooperative interactions between bacteria. How can these sort of interactions between microbes and a microbiome influence the core process of plasma transfer and maintenance. So understanding intra-community microbial interactions and the role of plasma spread. Um, so this leads to the main research question I focused on, understanding how microbiome, so well, asking the question whether microbiome members affect plasma spread of a focal donor or second pair. And to, to study this, we look at the growth rates firstly, um, so the fitness effects, um, secondly, the conjugation rates, and then thirdly, what this can mean for uh, the final within population plasma frequency. 
So the system we focus on to study plasma dynamics uh, was the chicken gut microbiome, because in the Netherlands, uh, resistance genes have been described as particularly prevalent within the chicken gut and also in a range of other livestock animals. And what's interesting is that the extended spectrum beta lactamases, um, so these are involved in antibiotic degradation and resistance to a whole range of beta lactams, including cefotaxime. Um, and a particular resistance gene carried on a large plasma. So this is called the BLASCTXM1 resistance gene associated with an INC I1 plasma. It's particularly common in the chicken gut, so in chickens, particularly in broiler chickens used for meat production, and also across a range of livestock animals. And also, if you look, um, there was a study, a 10 year study. Um, looking at the location of these ESBL resistance genes, and there was a strong bias towards them being carried on plasmids rather than on the chromosome. Um, so looking at this specific combination, we wanted to understand more about the uh, prevalence of this uh, specific gene carried on an INC I1 plasmid um, within the microbiome context. So this is a, a large plasmid, 100 kilobases. It has a narrow host range, so it exists in E. coli and salmonella species, and it has a low copy number, so you say typically one, possibly two copies per cell. And then we wanted to understand uh, the role of uh, microbial interactions of the chicken gut on the spread of uh, this plasmid um, in a controlled system. So we set this up by uh, looking at the, uh, the sequel microbiome um, well, of some microbes that could be cultured from the chicken gut microbiome. So we took our samples naturally um, from farms. We collected sequel samples. So this is from um, the, uh, the end part of the large intestine, <laughs> you're not familiar. Um, where there's a high concentration and microbial diversity of bacteria. We know that conjugation also occurs readily um, in this part of the gut. So we took samples from adult chickens and then brought them into the lab, preserved them by freezing them, mixing with glycerol, and then cultured them in a rich medium. So uh, this medium is described in the literature, uh, the endolithium medium. It's, so it's a rich medium. It can, contains a high nitrogen source and has been described to somewhat mimic the chicken gut microbiome environment. Um, so we grew up replica cultures in this medium in the lab. And then we spun down the cultures, and so to collect the cell pellet of um, whichever microbes had grown from these gut samples, and then collected the medium, um, and so the, the supernatant or the spent medium from these cultures. Um, so this would contain any secreted products from the microbes from the chicken gut. So we filtered this, and then by replenishing all nutrients by mixing with fresh medium, we could then use this as a new type of medium to test the role of microbial secretions on our specific processes of uh, plasma transfer. Um, so this is a medium containing any, say, metabolites um, or other molecules secreted from bacteria. Um, so we use this for growth and plasma transfer assays. So this brings me on to the second part of how we set this up. So this was all done in a lab strain of the typical MG1655 background, but we moved to a natural plasma to so the combination I described, so the CTXM1 resistance exists in on an NKI1 plasma. We moved this via conjugation um, from a natural chicken isolate strain into the MG1655 background. So that would be our donor strain on the far left here. Um, and we isolated a spontaneous nanodixic acid resistant mutant of uh, um, this MG1655 background. So it had a label for selection. Um, so when we, uh, yeah, so well, I'll describe that later for the conjugation assay. It could be selected when plated on agar. So we could profile uh, the growth of this strain and also um, the recipient strain 
we could use for conjugation. So also in the MG1655 background, this was a differentially labeled version. It had a chloramine clinical resistance marker in its chromosome via a gene insertion. And then the transconjugant strain, um, we wanted to profile the growth of this strain as well. This was formed in a prior conjugation assay between the natural ESBL E. coli strain. We transferred this into the recipient strain background. So then we created a transconjugant strain. So we had these three strains in advance that we could profile the growth of. And we did this via automated optical density profiling and so measuring the OD at 600 nanometers in a plate reader. Um, so in a micro play, we can set up multiple conditions and we can profile these three strains and replicates um, to quantify their growth rates um, with or without the plasmid um, between our three populations. And then secondly, uh, we performed a conjugation assay. So this was done in a similar way within a 96 well plate. We mixed a 50-50 culture of the donor recipient strain together um, and incubated this at 37 degrees over a four hour transfer period. So relatively short. Um, and after this period, um, we could play to the start and the end point to select for our three populations. So by the selective platen, uh, for nanodexic acid for the donor strain, the recipient strain plated on chloramine phenacol um, containing agar, and the transconjugate could be selected with cefotaxime and chloramine phenacol. Um, so, firstly, uh, looking at the results of what we found in the chicken gut sample, so going back to the first part of the study, um, we characterized via 16S rRNA sequencing the V3 to V4 uh, hypervariable region. So we um, did this for uh, the cultured sample. Um, and so what's shown here is the gut microbes that could actually grow um, under the lab conditions we had. We were culturing under aerobic conditions. That's uh, what we had access to, and that's how we performed our conjugation assays. So we wanted to keep the, the same conditions. Um, but we'd grown the microbes at 41 degrees and control the pH to try to somehow replicate the chicken gut environment. Um, so we saw a strong en enrichment for lactic acid bacteria in three genera. Um, and we had three replicates, uh, so supernatants one to six with three replicates of each. Um, so we saw consistency across replicates. Um, and so two of the so we saw a, a single genus in um, almost all of our samples, apart from supernatant six, where we saw a mix of enterococcus and pediococcus. So, so lactobacillus and pediococcus are both within the lactobacillaceae, which is the third most abundant family in the chicken cecum. Enterococcus is found in low abundance. And studies have shown that these types of bacteria to have probiotic effects and to, uh, to reduce the growth of uh, E. coli, um, perhaps via toxin production. So um, it's interesting to see that we could culture these bacteria and now look at the, um, the role of them on uh, the plasmid transfer and growth assays. Um, so we then wanted to select a suitable concentration of the supernatant to use to grow our strains. Um, so this is a, a pilot experiment uh, I firstly performed to look at the uh, dose response effect of adding in a, a certain concentration of supernatant into the medium and fully replenishing for all, all nutrients. So, so this is an endpoint measurement of growth across uh, different uh, concentrations of supernatant in a fully nutrient replenished medium. So what we saw th that there was this uh, dose response effect, so adding more supernatant um, really inhibited the growth of our E. coli strains, even if we fully replenished with nutrients. So it showed that there was something strongly inhibitory being produced by these, these gut microbes that was affecting the growth of E. coli. Um, so then I selected this moderately inhibitory concentration, so of 20% supernatant, 
to perform for um, to select for the growth and conjugation assays because we still wanted to see some growth of our strains and not completely inhibit it. Um, so we used 20% supernatants and then replenished with nutrients, assuming that all nutrients had been completely exhausted um, during growth in the span medium. Um, so then this, uh, uh, we firstly looked at the effective growth rates of the span media. So relative to control treatments, we had two uh, control treatment groups. Um, so one, um, so replenishing all nutrients, but then we had a, a slightly higher nutrient concentration in the medium we were mixing with the supernatant, which resulted in um, a slightly higher concentration of nutrients when it was mixed with the supernatant. So, so um, we compared to, between these two control groups and the supernatant groups, and what we saw was that there was a significant reduction in growth rates of both for both the donor and recipient strains. This was uh, more uh, noticeable for the donor with strain and the recipient strain, but we saw similar magnitudes of growth rate reduction, um, particularly in this supernatant at six, that was a mix of pediococcus and enterococcus. Overall, we didn't see a significant fitness cost of the plasma, so surprisingly, um, in this MG1655 background. Um, however, um, so there was, a, it was very small, say 2% overall looking across all the supernatants but, um, and the control media. However, there are some slight differences we do see between control and supernatants. Um, so then we uh, looked at the natural E. coli strain background, and we also saw a reduction in growth rates um, in at least, well, a couple of the supernatants. We saw quite a lot of variability across data points, um, but we did see reductions, at least in the pedococcus and um, the mixed supernatants. There's also reduced growth rates of natural E. coli strain. So it wasn't um, just reducing growth rates of this lab adapted strain. It was also found in a natural strain. Um, and then we looked at conjugation rates. So, so the effect of uh, supernatant media on uh, the rate of plasma transfer. And to, in particular, we used this endpoint conjugation rate measure rather than a conjugation frequency. I won't go into a lot of detail here because uh, Jana will talk on this tomorrow. Um, but basically we took into account different growth rates of the three populations and uh, the start and end point population densities of all three populations to control for um, cell contact opportunities um, across different uh, conditions. So different growth rates and densities during um, across different treatments. So for example, between control and supernatant treatments. And we saw quite a lot of variability across these data points and no significant effect of the super, supernatant media on conjugation rates. Um, so then we wanted to input this data and, and in collaboration with modelers, they developed this a simple ecological model um, to use uh, to look at our growth rate and conjugation rate measures and use these two parameters, a simple ecological model um, simulating an environment of a um, so a situation of a plasmid invasion into an otherwise uh, isogenic population of E. coli. So something that may be typical in the chicken gut uh, with a continuous flow of nutrients. So a constant population size, but a continuous turnover of cells. And uh, we predicted that um, the within population plasmid frequency, so within an E. coli population, would be dependent upon the growth rate difference between the donor and recipient strain, the conjugation rate, and the population density, so just of E. coli here. Um, and for reference, uh, um, a cell density of 10 to the 8 cells per milliliter or less would be roughly equivalent to E. coli in the chicken gut. Um, so we developed this uh, a simple model and uh, looked at the, um, so define the parameter spaces for three 
um, equilibrium situation, so where the plasma will be lost in the gray region, where the plasma will be fixed at an intermediate frequency in the dark region, and where the plasma would become completely fixed in the population in the white region. And what we saw was that uh, uh, due to subtle differences in the growth, so the growth rate difference between the donor and recipient population, this growth rate difference was uh, slightly increased in the supernatant uh, treatments. Uh, so it, it shown by the color points compared to the black points, we, we saw a shift towards uh, plasma loss um, compared to plasma fixation due to the, these small differences in growth rates. So, so this model would predict that uh, over time, um, the microbial secretions would be suggested to lead to plasma loss in the population. Um, so to uh, conclude, uh, what this has shown is that chicken gut microbiome members, specifically of the lactic, lactic acid bacteria, can limit the spread of a antimicrobial resistance plasma, specifically in E. coli. And this was due to uh, reductions in growth rates and the small growth rate difference um, in that reduction um, on the donor strain compared to the recipient strain. Um, so via fitness differences, rather than any significant reductions in conjugation rates, we predict that this could lead to an increased chance of plasma loss say within an in, um, in vivo environment in the gastrointestinal tract. And the approach that I show here presents um, a new and a, a feasible approach to test to, to extend beyond standard in vitro conjugation assays that are often done in a rich laboratory medium, often with um, well, lab plasmids, um, not from natural systems. So the, this allows an approach to incorporate additional um, factors. So, for example, looking at the role of this could be extended to look at the role of anaerobic conditions on plasma transfer and additional um, environmental parameters. So, combining both the experimental and a theoretical approach to predict the effect of specific environmental factors on uh, plasma stability. Um, Within, within population. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, my supervisor, Ian Visser in the Laboratory of Genetics, and also collaborators at Utrecht University and um, at the uh, Ecology Institute of Ecology in the Netherlands. And I'd like to thank the funders too, and thank you for the opportunity to present today and look forward to your questions. Well done, very interesting. Uh, are there, let me check this time properly if there are hands. No, there are no hands and no questions. Are there any questions? The, the, the experimental setup was like awesome. Thank you. <laughs> like, I mean, so, re, so experimental, so controlled, but so real. Yeah. It's kind of wow. <laughs> so does anybody have any question for Sarah? Comments? Okay. So do we pass on to the next speaker and thanks. Thanks.